very brief because Anuj is one of us. So it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Anuj Mubai. He has been working with us on and off, but uh, he was at ASU before for a new venture in life. He'll tell us a little bit more about it. But uh, he's been very actively working with us indirectly, at least through, through folks and, and his own work. And he's done some remarkably interesting work on SARS-CoV-2. His background is, is in applied mathematics. And uh, I must say, Anuj has got an excellent record in terms of mentoring students. Many of his students have gone on to find very good positions in other places. If I remember right, uh, one of the postdocs in Allison's group is also your student, Anuj. Is it correct? Uh, Abhishek, so Abhishek yeah. is, is uh, so we have connections here and, and in Allison's group. So thank you very much, Anuj. Uh, looking forward to your talk. Thank you, Madhav, very much. First of all, inviting me for this presentation so that I could share with you all my background, my experiences, but also making me part of this big community where I'm learning every time I was part of the seminar or some discussion or some papers that comes out of the group. So thank you very much. It's very kind of you all to invite me for this presentation. Well, I'm currently at Precision HR, which is a health economics company. I do many of those things that I used to do. And they give me a kind of a free hand in many of these things. In fact, we are working on COVID, but because of these working with the clients, it is difficult to present those things until we get clearance on those projects. So I thought of what to present today. So I am presenting today is actually one of my old uh, and very dearest research topics on neglected vector bond diseases. And I'm, as uh, Madhav was mentioning, I'm an applied mathematician by training. So much of the work is on how you study the complexity in which are inherent in this type of uh, disease system. I'm also currently part of Illinois State University, uh, and I'm uh, teaching a biomathematics course there, as well as College of Health Solution at Arizona State University. So briefly, uh, neglected tropical disease, uh, what are those ones? What is critical aspects that we care from a modeling and from the practical ground level perspectives? What are scales in it? What, what scales we talk about? And then what do I mean by saying ecological complexity when we try to capture the risk associated with this neglected vector-borne diseases? For example, there are multiple host species. There are vector preferences. Vectors are like mosquitoes and malaria, for example, and spatial heterogeneities, the people from one location versus people in uh, other locations. And then I will talk about two examples from my research. It's on leishmaniasis, visceral leishmaniasis in particularly, and tripanosoma cruzi, which is a pathogen for Chagas disease. Why we talk about NTDs? Well, with COVID uh, has changed quite drastically. Before COVID, there was already quite uh, differences in the way the people were having the resources for commonly directly transmitted disease versus neglected tropical diseases. But after COVID, this gap has increased drastically. There was already a huge gap before COVID, but uh, during COVID, at his, this gap of availability of the resources and practical whether it is a treatment, whether it is an intervention of any sort, whether it is resources to control it has become down drastically. And this is a major concern in near future. If we will not focus on it, there will be a huge challenges to the society as a whole. So when I talk about a neglected tropical disease, uh, vector bond diseases are kind of a core of these diseases. For example, malaria, we all heard, but the some of the unknown diseases are leishmaniasis, Chagas disease, and these are, or lymphatic filariasis. These are caused by certain pathogen, but they are not directly transmitted. They are transmitted by some vector species. For example, leishmaniasis spread by sand flies. And there are different hosts which are involved in it. And they could be anthropognotic or zoonotic. Anthropognotic means humans are the only carrier, whereas zoonotic means that animals could be, or mammals could be, part of the cycle of the transmission. It disproportionately infect uh, many of the poor countries and tropical regions, as you can see in this map, shows very clearly what regions are affected. So in 2012, 
WHO tried to focus on neglected tropical disease with the help from Gate Foundations and 10 pharmaceutical, big pharmaceutical companies, which were ready to put some resources to control of many of these diseases. So basically neglected word means the resources are very limited. There's not much efforts by pharmaceutical companies. These are hundreds of years old a disease. So at least 100 years when we say we recognize it as a disease 100 years ago, but it could be more older than that. And it's affecting billions of people in the world. Primarily the poor and developing countries are affected by them. So they are divided into somewhat micro and macro. There are 21 listed by WHO as a neglected tropical disease. Of course, disease as a whole, we talk about pathogens and viruses and protozoa bacteria. But then also in the same list, there is snake bite, also part of this neglected tropical disease. People die from snake bites in some of the developing countries. But my focus in my work has been on protozoa diseases, Chagas and Leishmaniasis. I've worked somewhat on lymphatic filariasis as well, which is helmets, warm diseases. And they are modeled in a very different way, microparasite and macroparasites. Microparasites are smaller and macros are warm diseases, which are bigger in size, roughly. And there are other characteristics which makes it different between them. What I do in my research is complexity involved in it. How do we understand that what aspects of the systems is driving the prevalence of the disease or dynamics of the disease in general? The disease system has incredible diversity with whether we are talking about different types of pathogen species, host, vectors species. So these all contribute along with the environment around it, uh, causes different types of uh, transmission cycle to exist and the diversity in the disease system. In order to make some interesting aspects on my research, I want to first give a few examples, which are kind of a counterintuitive example to control NTD. During NTD control, NTD stands for neglected tropical disease. Um, there has some things that people saw, which was unknown earlier. So for example, visceral leishmaniasis in Brazil is spread among humans, of course, and it's a major public health concern in Brazil, but domestic dogs are primary reservoirs. So much of the effort the Brazil has focused on is to control domestic dogs in the community. And one thing what they do as a control is to mass eliminate seropositive dogs. And they think that by doing something like that, they would be able to decrease the prevalence of zoonotic visceral leishmaniasis. However, from 1990 to 1997, around 176,000 seropositive dogs were killed. But the disease didn't reduce. And that was the challenge uh, during in 1990s, why the prevalence didn't decrease in spite of so many killings of these dogs, which were the primary reservoir host for it. Well, in fact, what they found is that the number of human cases increases because sand flies were now biting humans because they were not having those domestic dogs as a reservoir host, those that were killed during the mass elimination. So this is a very good example, which shows that a host diversity, how it changes the infection prevalence in a not a simple way. They killed many dogs because of this, but it was a counterintuitive examples and the disease prevalence in fact increased at the end of the 90s in 1990s. Second example, this one is a study from India, uh, which is control of malaria in uh, India. And there's a study in 2016, which talks about that all the efforts by Indian governments for Ministry of Health were focusing on human indoor residual uh, spraying for malaria control. But it's, uh, it seems like many of the villages in India, especially the study talks about in Orissa, has Orissa is a state in India they have these kettle shed right next to their houses. And many of these species of mosquitoes are zoophilic. That means they prefer feeding on kettles and they rest in the kettle sheds and they feed on both cows and, and humans. And if you are focusing only on human dwellings, that controls is 
less effective and you have to even consider kettle sheds but you have to understand this this study in particularly found that the mosquitoes are zoophilic behavior has that means they prefer cows as well or animal kettles so in fact what they did was they did an experiment and um, they uh, imitated a temporary kettle sheds around the villages and once in the evening they take these kettles around the villages to put it in those kettle sheds and uh, they found that the um, that the disease incidence drastically dropped in those villages and so just shifting the kettle sheds from next to their houses to the periphery of the village resulted in drastic decrease in the incidence of the malaria in those villages so what this is showing is the the changes in the dynamics of the density of the host species in in the environment can drastically impact the prevalence or incidence of the infection in the community so beautiful example this one and uh, now they are focusing on kettle shed in fact for indoor residual spraying as well this third example actually is of a disease visceral ischemiasis which is also known as kalazar in india it's a life threatening disease people die from it and if they don't go for treatment even with the treatment there is a quite a significant mortality it is spread by the sand flies insect sand flies this visceral ischemiasis is the second largest parasite killer in the world responsible for 30000 deaths uh, worldwide so of course this is a disease well known 100 years old disease but then the disease post kalazar dermalis is a sequel of disease same parasite same way it is transmitted but it's a it's only 1 to 5% of successfully leishmaniasis treated patients develop this thing so why it happens it is not very clear but it was from a clinical perspective was this described in 1922 but it's a sequel of the disease and we are talking about humans some humans are showing only visceral leishmaniasis treated successfully but there are some fraction who are treated for visceral leishmaniasis get this pkdl disease now in 1980s there was a huge ddt spray program for malaria killing that brought down even the sand flies drastically and uh, that resulted in literally not having Uh, visceral leishmaniasis in the community however in 1991 this leishmaniasis came back if you see in this picture in 1991 it came back in spite of drastically reducing sand fly population by ddt spraying ddt is insecticide that is was extensively sprayed in uh, for malaria control in 1980s so why did it came back later on it was found it was came back because they were not considering these cases of pkdl in their surveillance systems and although there were few of cases but they were drastic in initiating the outbreak of the disease so what it shows is the host species in the previous example it was the kettles were the host but in this example it's a different stage of the disease uh, those type of people can also cause the infection so the host could be same but the infection stages in the same host species can initiate the outbreak if it is not properly considered in the disease system so these three examples one on dog as a primary reservoir in the in brazil for zoonotic visceral leishmaniasis and kettles in the malaria in india and pkdl cases uh, which are human cases but of a different uh, uh, pkdl patient do not die by the way and visceral leishmaniasis die from the disease so these uh, different types of individuals human individuals can initiate an outbreak so what we i'm discussing here is something that has been recently recognized as a uh, that in order to study a disease system especially of um, vector borne diseases we have to consider something called as integrated human and animal health approach which also takes into account socio ecological system and it is referred as in the literature as one health approach uh, and malaria is a very good examples uh, the malaria that i was showing this now the livestock can be used as an interventions 
for control of malaria because you can divert the bites from the human to kettles. However, there is a problem with this approach also is that the livestock, if you put the lot of livestock and the, the, uh, the vector is start to bite more livestock, uh, then you are counterintuitively, you are also increasing the density of the vectors in the community. And therefore, you may increase the infection incidence in the humans. So there has to be a very light balance of how much livestock you use as an intervention and what is the preference for the vector towards this livestock. So there has to be a balance we have to do. Otherwise, we may think that we are doing good, but overall, there might be a negative impact. So the factors that uh, from a mathematical modeling uh, that what we consider Basically, what we do as an applied mathematics is we talk about threshold behavior in the system. When can things tip off? There's a very book, a beautiful book, The Tipping Point by Malcolm Gadwells, in which uh, he talks about a real life scenario, like, for example, uh, roids. Um, uh, roids sometimes becomes a big, and uh, some other times it is not really a big issue. For example, Arab Springs. Um, somehow Arab Spring spread some in Tunisia, there was a local problem, but that becomes into a big Arab Springs, whereas many times the similar type of problem in different locations doesn't become like a big thing. So this Malcolm Gadwell in Tipping Point book is talking about real life examples without considering the mathematical models into it. But we do a similar thing in applied mathematics. We talked about bifurcation analysis and we rigorously study the components of the models and how that goes into when the system tips to a different state. It is less of a prediction than more of a understanding of the mechanism. And it can be very easily understood from an epidemiological context. The vector-borne diseases that I'm discussing right now has, of course, host vector and pathogens that are coming together in a certain way so that the pathogen can spread a lot in the environment, in a certain environment. But there are certain things that are very critical in it. For example, different type of host species. What is the strength of the each host species? Competence. That means, are they able, uh, some hosts are a good, able to uh, transmit the infection good, where some are not. Social behavior of the host. Vectors are important because vector feeding preference, whether they feed on kettles, whether they feed on human more. So those things are very critical in the dynamics of this vector-borne diseases. And of course, the pathogen's characteristics becomes very critical. One more thing which becomes very important in this is the transmission cycles. For example, how the transmission is occurring, uh, whether it is occurring as a vertical transmission from mothers to babies or oral transmission. That means by mistakes, animals are eating the insects and insects which are infected with the pathogens are transmitting it to the host because they are by mistake, they are eating it. So oral consumption becomes very crit critical in some of the disease. As we all know, and I've just give a brief outline to make my point more clearer. We all know how to model incidence rate and many different uh, assumptions goes into that. One thing which is there in these assumption in the directly transmitted disease is a contact rate, C, and then P is a probability of transmission given a contact, given a single contact. And so how do you model the contact rate? Uh, well. One way to model is taking contact rate as constant. If you take it constant, you get something what we referred as, as a frequency dependent transmission rate or standard incidence. But if you take a contact rate as of linearly depending on population size, then uh, we get something called as a mass action. So the contact rate is linearly increased in the mass actions uh, with the population size. So these two aspects are uh, more commonly used in epidemic models. But if you have an indirect transmission, that means through the vector, uh, then things become a little complex and you need to model it in a more complex way. For example, if you are interested in infected host transmitting it to the vector, which is uh, let's say mosquitoes through the bite, uh, 
then you have to know the maximum number of possible bytes per day by a single vector. You have to know the susceptible vectors, how many of those susceptible vectors are there. And that product will give you a number of total bytes per day by all susceptible vectors. And if you multiply by proportion of infected host, then this product, the first three terms product will give you fraction of bytes or the number of bytes that are all the susceptible vectors that are on infected host. But not all bytes are able to transfer the infection. Some bytes will successfully transfer, some will not. So you need a probability of successfully transmitting the parasite given one byte. So this is the way you model it. And that gives you a total incidence or total number of new cases that are gen generated by single host in the vector population. But if you talk about from vector to human, this is little different because now you are want to know how many vectors are landing on a particular host. So in that case, again, you need a number of bytes, but then you also need number of vectors landing on a one host. And that would give you the number of uh, received by one host from all the vectors landing on the, on the same host. And then you need a total number of susceptible host, of course, and the same way, number of bytes per day received by all susceptible host, proportion of those bytes that are on the infected host, and probability of successful transmission. So this is the very critical in order to understand how we model the biting or the transfer of infection, which is not same as modeling it in the directly transmitted disease. That's the important aspect. And if you simplify this thing in new infection in host by infected vector, then you get what you are seeing it in the, in the right time. One thing to note is the denominator in both the terms is host, is not vector here. In directly transmitted disease, it's the same population that you are talking about. You are choosing infected person from the same population here. But in, in the vector borne diseases, it's vector divided by the host here. This is a very critical aspect of it. So I published a book chapter a few years ago, and there I talked about what assumptions that goes in modeling these vector borne diseases, and that could lead to a contradictory uh, results. And basically your assumptions could be whether the abundance of host is there for vector feeding or very few hosts are there, or like there's lots of vectors are there. So it depends on what assumptions that you are taking. And the incidence term is changed based on how do we assume that the vector is, is abundance or a host is abundance. And when you change these incidence term, based on the assumption in the model, the reproduction number also changes and therefore the estimates of the reproduction numbers could be very varied. So sometimes the studies talked about different reproduction numbers of the same disease, of the same reason, but they have a different estimate just because their assumptions probably are different in those regions. Okay, so Let's see how we model the host and vectors. The some characteristics which are very critical is vector preference. There are different types of host species. You could have cattle, you could have a human host. But then there could be that the vector could choose infected over susceptible due to some evolutionary aspects that vector could change their behaviors. And how do you model that is by this, that there is a preference here in the denominator rather than a total population size of the host, uh, we are taking uh, some preference for the infected compartment. Alpha V is a preference and for susceptible, there is no preference basically. So denominators changes from the mixing uh, population changes because now vector are preferring more the infected uh, place. Host competence is also very critical. Host competence means ability for a host to transfer the infection successfully, can sustain it, can receive it. All these things makes it a competent host. Now, with, before we talk about competent hosts, there are many hosts, many different type of hosts that we talk about. Some are accidental hosts. They get the infection, but in general, we all have many viruses, pathogens in our body, but not affecting from the clinical perspective. 
those are called accidental host uh, host that gets an infection without impacting the host itself incidental host is the host can get infected but cannot able to transfer back uh, if there is a second bite on an infected host that cannot uh, and primary host is the host can get infected and in the host the pathogen develops over certain stages and become more stronger in in transferring whereas reservoir host is is they harbor the pathogens for long period of time without impacting the host the pathogen doesn't cause any clinical symptoms and can have uh, pathogens for long period of time and can transfer also very easily so those are reservoirs so there is a minor subtle difference between all these terminology that we talk about host so uh, what typically happens is in these mm, uh, complex models of vector borne diseases level of infection in the prevalence depends on right balance of vector preference host abundance and host competence so all these balance has to be in a right way to know the level of infection in the community so first study that i will talk about is on visceral leishmaniasis this recent study was published in royal society open science uh, here what we are doing is to investigate system complexity how complexity how do we model it and how do we study system complexity in the visceral leishmaniasis on the threshold behavior threshold for elimination threshold for control of the disease and also the prevalence of the infection so the type of heterogeneity that we are talking about we have host and vector we have biting heterogeneity because some host vector bite even in the same population vector bite in a very different ways some hosts get more wide maybe because of ecological aspects and because of vicinity with the habitat conditions so we have incorporated biting heterogeneity into it we have also have a reservoirs in this models we, uh, we are talking about reservoir could be kettles or could be livestock in general uh, reservoir heterogeneity we have talked about reservoirs who are a good transmitter of infection and reservoir which are bad transmitter of infection and the biting preference the, how they bite and also we have incorporated spatial heterogeneity movement of people between the space so all these factors makes this system very complex to understand it and we have tried to attempt it to describe it very rigorously using mathematical tools or bifurcation analysis the life cycle of uh, leishmania has many reservoirs it is a 100 years old disease and we have not able to control it yet why is it the factors and the, uh, we only focus pre- many times on humans but there has been a recent studies in two, uh, actually 2013 study which takes the blood meals from these different hosts like cattle goat buffalo rat chicken and they have found the pr- incidence in many of these host species different host species so it seems like that vector is biting many different host and there is a potential for infection spread through that so we constructed this minimal model again the goal is to investigate the threshold behavior in the presence of multiple complexity associated with so we talked about minimal models that we can understand comprehend it we don't want to exhaustive model but we want a minimal model to understand it so we took multiple host two reservoirs one humans and one sand fly populations and we talked about multiple patches so patches are connected through the movement of the people then we in each patch we defined this interactions of these populations for example uh, there is a human population there is a, a sand fly population there is a reservoir a and there is a reservoir b reservoir a is animal reservoir and animal maybe cows and goats for example and uh, also important is the term which is post kalazar dermolishment which is sequel of the disease k here is a sequel of the disease which is post colon so it has many complexity and we wanted to address what conditions on the model parameters which have biological meanings that the disease prevalence or the threshold behavior would change <laughs>
One other things which we have incorporated also is the biting heterogeneity. So number of bites in mth individuals is Poisson distributed uh, that we assumed in the models and with a mean of certain thing where the mean itself is gamma distributed. So that is capturing the, the variation that has been observed in the field and these distribution describe that heterogeneity quite well. If you do some calculations and in, in the paper, we did uh, describe it in detail, the incidence is not a typical way of uh, modeling it. The transmission term is not a typical way. It's actually a very complex way of modeling it. It has a logarithmic, this L stands for host species and V stands for vector. So in host species, the transmission terms is actually very complex. Assuming all those heterogeneity that I talked about in the previous slide, as well as biting heterogeneity and the vector heterogeneity is captured by this transmission term. On top of it, if I incorporate the movement or spatial aspects, human mobility, this transmission term becomes more complex and the movement we are talking about is a short term movement, not a long term. So in short term movement, you talk about resident time, that fraction of time of the daily time that people are spending in the different patches, for example, then this transmission rate becomes more complex, but takes into account the movement of different host species. For example, a reservoir host is A and B here, and human host are, and you can incorporate by um, these two parameters that we are incorporating, delta Ij and rho Ij, which is capturing the movement between the patches. So if you have this transmission dynamic, the first question comes, there's so much of heterogeneity in this model. How do we study and how do we uh, make sense out of the results? So we do a standard bifurcation in it. And first result, what we found is that this ROS is the complete reproduction number. Reproduction numbers, as we all know, describes the disease persistence or eliminations. Well, in this model, each patch's reproduction numbers are less than one, but the overall reproduction numbers can be. So you can think about disease being controlled in each of the patches separately. But when we take the whole system where the movement of the people are also there, the disease will persist in those and our reproduction number would, can be greater than one. So we have seen the scenarios in our work. So one thing to here, what we have done, reproduction number is less interesting here in this vector bond models than sandfly density threshold. So instead of reproduction number, we use a sandfly density threshold. Why it is important? Because sandfly density is controlled by insecticide spraying. And therefore, we want to know uh, reproduction number is difficult to measure practically in the field in the vector bond diseases. So sandfly density is what is used as a threshold quantity for understanding this disease. So uh, one of the results suggests sandfly density threshold for VL elimination will be lower considering spatial structure. If you consider spatial structures, uh, heterogeneity, then movement of the host and, and uh, reservoirs, then the Threshold levels are much lower. Threshold for infect, uh, VL control is much lower in the spatial model. So sometimes spatial structure is important. And if you do not consider, you would have a, a wrong threshold, basically, uh, of VL elimination. So that could be the reason why uh, visceral spinosis is may not be able to be controlled in India, for example, for so long. We also find that biting heterogeneity, biting, if you increase the biting heterogeneity, it increases the threshold. So, okay, before I go into biting heterogeneity, one thing we have found in this is a backward bifurcation occurs. That means the disease under, in if the backward bifurcation doesn't exist, then the disease has a clear cut threshold phenomena at one, are not less than one, the disease can be controlled, are not greater than one, not controlled. But if the backward bifurcation occurs, then the, there is much lower than one threshold uh, conditions exist. And so uh, backward bifurcation occur because of the two aspects in the models, uh, disease induced death rates and the movement rates. And that is a very interesting aspects that we have found in the model. Not only that, this threshold behavior, 
increases in biting heterogeneity the more variability in the biting characteristics on the host for the vectors the threshold decreases over time threshold decreases uh, as the biting heterogeneity increases so you see the vertex of the parabola this decreases this vert vertex decreases with uh, increase in biting heterogeneity that is showing the threshold so in order to control a disease we need to make this density of the sand fly less than this quantity in order to de uh, decrease the disease because then this is stable but if it is density is bigger then you could have a condition whether of course disease can be controlled but if you are above this vertex that this disease could be the the endemic state is stable therefore the disease will establish itself so this vertex is very critical and that describes the critical sand fly density rate to to talk about so the overall the gist of the story is the biting heterogeneity the variation the larger variation in uh, biting it increases the sand fly threshold so this sand fly threshold is increases so this is increasing and lowers the infection so this y axis is a human prevalence and it is lowering the rate of the human infection threshold to so very important aspects that we are learning from this model second thing what we have found is if you have patches which are similar in characteristic patches similar in means they have a same demographic and epidemiological characteristic as the other patches then regardless of the connection between it or coupling or the movement rate in it the infection prevalence or threshold behavior will be similar as you are seeing in the uh, left hand side both the patches will have a same threshold behavior but if you increase the dissimilarities if if the population characteristics will be different quite different then we see that the threshold behaviors are very different so one of the way we are talking about dissimilarity is by taking a human birth rate higher in patch 1 than in patch 2 okay so in that case what we are saying is sand fly density threshold for visceral leishmaniasis elimination will be lower if you incorporate spatial heterogeneity so that's an interesting point also the spatial heterogeneity decreases the sand fly density threshold now another thing that we are interested in knowing is also integral stability or measure of resilience of the system how resilient is our system and basically the overall idea is the gist of it is we are talking about basing of attractions in the backward bifurcation region there are two equilibrium that are multi stable system this is a multi stable system in the same parameter regimes it depends on initial condition which stable equilibrium the system will go into but the basin of attraction as with respect to the parameters if you perturb the parameters how the basis of attraction squeezes or or expand integral stability talks about that and it it basically gives you uh, the resilience of the system how uh, resilient the system is to the perturbation of the parameters so just to talk about the gist of the result is that as the reproduction number increases reproduction number increases means you are perturbing the parameters because reproduction number is a make of a lot of parameters so as your reproduction number changes there are so many moving parts in the system that is very difficult to talk about changes in the perturbation so reproduction number is a best way to change doing the perturbation Uh, integral stability changes for both the equilibriums and it turns out in the multi host model the last bullet disease free equilibrium is more resilient when dead end host are there the reservoir host are the dead ones than in uh, their endemic equilibrium so uh, if there is a dead end host in the system the disease will most likely to die out so this is about the threshold behavior the second study here we talk about scales here and how these scales so very quickly i will talk about this two strain sylvetic transmission of trypanosoma cruzi now here also this is very complex pathogen transmission occurs by a vector species called as triatoma this is also called as kissing bug the parasites is called as a trypanosoma cruzi which causes a chagas disease in humans by the way uh, 
it has multiple strains that are circulates in it and there are many reservoirs of it sylvetic reservoirs such as raccoons possum wood rats and so on and so forth we are talking about in us as a wildlife disease why because those are the the reservoir that harbor the infections and the infection can spill over to human from time to time so we need to understand what is happening in the sylvetic host so so humans are rare in us but it happens the infection that causes the chagas disease but the prevalence in the wild host species sylvetic host raccoons and possums and wood rats are quite high very high so the characteristics of this trypanosoma cruvi infection is multiple host multiple vector species uh, vector triatoma has different species that are circulating the infection the transmission pathways are also very different so just to summarize it of course to the vector uh, the infection is transmitted through the bites to the host the infection is transmitted in a multiple way actually in three ways through the biting but also through the oral consumption that means animals are eating the bugs by mistakes and getting infected that's an oral come and a vertical transmission that means mothers to babies so these are the ways that that it can be transfers uh, three different ways and in fact there are two strains in us that causes this infection to spread type 1 and type 2 a strains the interesting part is in mexico it is a very dominant strain it causes chagas disease lot of people die from the chagas disease but in us it doesn't so we model this texas region which is consist of three broadly speaking regions this color coding is due to the cycle distinct cycle in which specific type of host specific type of vector species are present and the strain so for example there is number 3 which is a us primarily us is the region where possum and raccoons are host species and the species of the vectors are very particular whereas in mexico wood rats are there and there is a different species and in two which is a texas region these two cycles come together and interact and the question that we were asking is is the pathogenic strain in mexico which causes the chagas disease can take over and become common in us or not what are the condition under which these mexican strain becomes common so type 1 which is in mexico becomes or more dominant in the us type 2 so we consider simple model one host one vector two strain model and three transmission pathways three transmission pathways because we have biting oral consumption and vertical transmission and the system becomes a combination of host vector infection dynamics but also predator prey types of dynamics why predator prey because oral consumption is one way of which the host is becoming infected so predator prey and host vector dynamics comes together and so what we found is the host transmission along with vertical so let's talk about so we found a bifurcation region in which one strain could be possible or both the strain could be possible in fact in this type of model both strain is not possible in the same region only one strain can exist so e1 stands for strain 1 existing e2 stands for strain 2 existing and e0 stands for none of the two strain exist though no infection exist and there is a bifurcation on which uh, we can actually plot a specific region on which these uh, infections are prospecting of each strain so overall the gist of the story was that adaptation to vertical transmission so remember that type 1 is spread by only biting type 2 is spread by biting and vertical transmission but oral transmission was somewhat not sure so in order for the strain type 1 to take over the type 2 that means mexican strain to become dominant in us that it has to be adapted by over oral transmission the host should be able to get infected in sufficient number by eating infected vectors
So this is a beautiful work that has been actually a sequence of work has been published in many tropical disease journals also. So I want to thank at this point and stop here. Uh, I don't want to bore, but I think the whole story that I presented today was role of complexity that are inherent in this vector bond diseases or neglected vector bond diseases to study the threshold behavior. So thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much, Anuj. Excellent talk. Very, very broad talk. I think it fits the interests of the expeditions project very nicely. Um, and uh, our, our institute's interest, in fact. Well, one thing I want to add, um, Madhav, is also that I'm working on COVID aspects also, but uh, I wanted to present this, my own research focus, uh, but I have been also working on airplane policies or boarding policies or deplaning policies, how that COVID has impacted that policy and what could be the right way to understand infection spread in the airplanes, for examples. This um, is good, uh, Anuj. I think we're all a little tired of COVID at this point. Yeah, I time, know. So. That, is why, that is why I present <laughs> the COVID fatigue right now. So <laughs> something different is absolutely welcome right now. Anuj, can I just ask, is, have you published anything on that airplane work or that's still stuff you're working on now? Yeah, it is, it is published actually, although uh, we have been doing it since 2015 when there was what yes, Ebola outbreak. So we have been publishing continuously. Recently, we actually talked about whether leaving the middle seat vacant makes any difference or not. You know, all of a sudden, randomly, this airlines started to have middle seat vacant policy. But was it really helpful? Or is it just making people kind of feel good about any policy without truly having any impact on the infection spread. And we, we showed with our modeling work in the, on the airplane that, in fact, that has nothing to do with the infection control. Uh, middle seat vacant has no impact, literally, a very small impact. What would you say, do you, if you were to direct me one place to look for the best estimate of how much taking an airplane voyage increases your risk of over whatever else you'd be doing during those hours, <laughs> like where would you refer me for that? Well, I, I'm not a public health expert and I don't know all the detail, but what I can say is one thing is what we looked at it is the boarding policy. For example, Southwest Airlines on one hand and American Airlines on another. Southwest has random boarding. Whosoever comes first goes in the plane, whereas American Airlines has zone-wise boarding. So we quantified if you take an airline which has a zone-wise boarding versus a southwest type of airline, how many infection that would generate. And you have to note one thing, in the airplane, infection is not spread during the flight because their ventilation system is quite good, actually. The infection is spread during boarding and deplaning or during the waiting in the airport, probably. And it's very rare also in the airport. So the question is to focus on these boarding policies. What we have recommended is take the flights in the Southwest rather than in the American Airlines because zone-wise is creating more infection because people are waiting in, in their zones and that is that waiting time is causing more contacts. That's okay for me because I only ever arrive like at the very last minute <laughs> <laughs> and they sometimes let me on and sometimes they don't. <laughs> So I have a question on the multi-patch model that you were talking about because it's very interesting, like the number of parameters that are that there's interplay. Have you observed in the data that you looked at for some regions that, say, for instance, the birth rates and the biting heterogeneity kind of match up such that it's very difficult to control, like one place blows up and then while it goes into a lull, the other goes up because of the movement patterns and how the host and vectors get re uh, replenished. Well, we did analyze it mathematically. So I think we have not linked it with the data, directly data. What we were looking at, so parameter uh, regime is quite complex and uh, we can divide into patches in the parameter regime that we can say one type of behavior will be in this patch, another type of behavior. So using these threshold parameters. So that was the task of it. If we can section this parameter regime, which is a complex, into these smaller parts where one type of characteristic or one type of threshold behavior exists. Now, the next step would be to use if, if in, in some village, 
one situation occurs, then you pick up the result of that square piece where the parameter regimes are more feasible. So linking with the data is another level of work and require much more. Now, also the mathematical analysis quickly becomes very complicated. So we have talked about cases under different scenarios. So for example, we have taken a case where there is a dead end host. That means those, those are not transmitting the infection anymore. I mean, they are receiving the infection, but they are not the, some hosts are not. So those are, that reduces the number of parameters to a smaller parameter regime where you can divide parameter regions into small, small sections. And those section has the same threshold behavior. Yeah, in fact, even for that two patch thing, if you map it out like a field and uh, try to see like if the other other parameter settings where you actually get something like these loops, even in the mathematical characterization, it seemed like it, it, it it's a very rich enough space that you right. end up uh, seeing them. You you are absolutely correct. You are absolutely it could have a very complex behavior. But remember, these are very well defined systems studied in the and the way we are deriving the system. Uh, these have uh, only two equilibriums. But the interesting part of the dynamics that we are seeing is the not a forward bifurcation but a backward bifurcation, and uh, of course it there is likely that there could be a complex system. But from the literature. We know that we may not have other strange attractors in this type of system because we have extended the same work that we have seen mathematically proven in the literature. So the chances is less that we can see some periodic orbit or strange attractor in some sense. But it is, again, I cannot guarantee it because we have looked at only special cases of the system. Thanks. That's a good question. Yeah, thank you. How, how much impact do you think climate change is going to have in the role of Chagas coming into the U.S. and changing the vector? A lot of changes, actually. This is um, climate change uh, changes the density of the vectors, and that is very, very important. But I again, if you talk about in a short term range, then climate change is an important aspect, and you can talk about seasonal outbreaks that are happening. But we are discussing on a long-term basis and uh, it, may, it may change some aspects of it. But again, we are doing this uh, integral stability, which is a perturbation in the parameters. So basically climate will going to change some uh, insect related parameters. And we have looked into the variation in these parameters, how that variation in the parameters will drive the system, how this dynamics will change. So we have given a comprehensive picture in that regard. But having said that, temperature and humidity has a major implications on a shorter time scale. Annual basis, for example, every year there is an outbreak of, because these are, vec depends on density of the vector. Yeah. Okay, well, we're just past our, uh, our stop time. So I just wanna thank Anuj again for his great talk today. And uh, thanks everyone for attending. Hope you can join again in two weeks for our next seminar. Thank you, Anuj. Thank you. Great talk. We'll be in touch. Yeah. Bye, everyone.